summer like fall day we have here. Uh, just before we get started, I wonder who is in the crowd today, whether you're in front or behind or to the side, who here has who here has ever walked before with the New Hampshire Rebellion? Any walkers, let's give it up. Who, who here has walked in the middle of winter with the New Hampshire Rebellion? And has the scars to prove it. All right. Who here has walked for democracy with Granny D? Anybody who here wishes they had walked with Granny D? All right. All right. It is wonderful to have such a crowd uh, and, and to be joined by people, supporters who have walked, supporters who are here for the first time. Is anybody here for their first New Hampshire Rebellion event? All right. All right. Welcome. Welcome. We are joined by members of our board, by Gordon Allen and Regina and Rick Gordon and Bob Perry, members of our advisory board like Jim Rubens, former state senator, and others who you will hear from very soon. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we can kick off a New Hampshire Rebellion rally to restore government of by and for the people without hearing from one of our fearless founding fathers, Paul Revere. Let's welcome up Paul Revere. Hear ye, hear ye, patriots, rebels. We gather today to continue our forefathers' fight for liberty and justice by declaring that our great independence from big money in politics before our nation's constitution was written, New Hampshire had created its own constitution. And enshrined in that constitution was the right, no, the duty, to strive and strive again to establish a government responsive to the people alone, one that does not privilege the wants of a small class of big money campaign contributors over the will of the people. As it says in Article 10, government being instituted for the common benefit, protection and security of the whole community, and not the private interest or emulation of any one man, family, or class of men. Therefore, whatever the ends of government are perverted and public liberty manifestly endangered and all other means of redress are ineffectual, the people may and of right ought to reform the old or establish new government. We, the people, pledge to fight big money in politics and restore government of, for, and by the people. We demand that our presidential candidates do the same. Thank you, Paul Revere. Let's give it up for one of our founding fathers, Paul Revere. Thank you, thank you. And, and be ready for our march that will follow, led by our very own Paul Revere. Now, ladies and gentlemen, three months from now, New Hampshire voters will cast their ballots in the first in the nation presidential primary. One year from now, Americans across this country will cast our ballots in the presidential general election to choose our next leader for president and for Congress. As we know, there are many important issues facing our country, many urgent issues that need to be addressed, from jobs in the economy, to energy and the environment, to education and health care. The list goes on. All of these issues matter. All of these, however, are affected by a single issue. Money in politics is not the most important issue, but it is the first issue that must be addressed if we are to elect leaders for president and Congress throughout this land who can solve the other urgent problems facing our country. And so the question is simple. Will the next president, whom we will vote for on February 9th, and whom our country will elect next November, will the next president represent we the people, or will that president be beholden to the big money in politics? Today, we are issuing a challenge 
to New Hampshire voters and to all the presidential candidates with the unveiling of our We the People pledge to fight big money. We are calling on at least 10,000 New Hampshire voters to sign this pledge right here to my right to demand that every presidential candidate and every person running for office in this land commit to supporting six core reforms that can loosen the stranglehold of big money over our democracy. We demand that the secret money flooding our elections is exposed and full transparency is required, number one. We demand that bribes from lobbyists and the revolving door be closed, that we end that system of pay to play. Number two, we demand that super PACs go out of business and that we overturn the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling once and for all. We demand a new system of small donor powered citizen funded elections to replace the big money dominating our democracy. Number four, we demand an end to gerrymandered districts where politicians pick the voters instead of the other way around and a modernizing of our election system. And finally, we demand, because our rights as equal citizens are worthless if they are not enforced, we demand real enforcement of these reforms by a new Federal Election Commission. Today begins a three-month march to the New Hampshire primary on February 9th. In the three months ahead, we will take to the streets in small town, in community across the state, to enlist our fellow citizens, at least 10,000 voters, to sign this pledge, demanding the presidential candidates support these reforms. And we are honored to be joined by Republicans and Democrats and independents alike because this issue transcends partisan politics. This is about we the people returning to our core principles as a nation. And so I am honored now to introduce two of our leaders in this fight representing two different sides of the political spectrum. To discuss the importance of this we the people pledge for our state and for our nation. First, I'm honored to introduce the former Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, a man who served as Associate Justice from 1995 to 2004, as Chief Justice from 2004 to 2010, who then went on to serve as Dean of the UNH School of Law, and as the Founding Executive Director of the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice and Public Service, someone who in his time also fought for reform. Please join me in welcoming former Chief Justice John Broderick. Good afternoon. I've, I've never had the privilege to follow Paul Revere. So it's not a bad day for me, Paul. I wonder if all of you would join me very briefly in acknowledging the incredible work and dedication of Dan Weeks. And I want to congratulate all of you for being here today. This is a huge issue, as Donald Trump would say. This is a huge issue in American public life and national and state politics. In, an, in a time where there's such division in this country, Republicans and Democrats can barely agree on the time of day. But almost all of them agree that Citizens United was bad law and bad public policy. And for that, we should be grateful. Change is necessary. Change is necessary. There was a time, and I've been in New Hampshire for more than four decades, when $100 made a difference, when $1,000 from a citizen was a huge contribution. We don't matter as much now as we used to. It ought to trouble every single American that 158 families, according to the New York Times, have contributed half the money that's been raised by both parties thus far in the presidential primaries. Think about that. 
that a fraction of 1% of the money in 2014 was given by people who are billionaires. My question is this, why would someone donate $100 million, dark, unaccountable money, to an independent group, a super PAC, unless they were buying something or believing they were buying something? I mean, you gotta deal with that reality. They're not doing it for good government. They're doing it for their personal interests. And the other thing that should trouble us is what is it they think they're buying and who's selling it? Who's selling it? I agree with Dan Weeks, until this issue is addressed, either by a constitutional amendment, and while we're waiting for that, by transparency. We could have transparency tomorrow. We could have transparency tomorrow. The Congress of the United States could pass a law making all those contributions public. That's not a violation of anyone's free speech. It's interesting to me, by the way, as a lawyer and a judge for all these years, that corporations do not have rights against self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment, but they have free speech rights under the First Amendment. That's troubling to me. It's troubling to me. The consequences of Citizen United may have been unintended, but they are very real. Members of Congress, members of Congress, spend between 30 and 70 percent of their day raising money. Isn't that shocking to you? It's really shocking to me. And it's very appropriate that Dan Weeks and all of you have started this campaign in a big way in the state, in the first in the nation primary. Our voice is loud nationally, but it needs to get a lot louder. Because if we don't deal with it, if we don't deal with this problem, pretty soon it won't matter who's on the ballot. It won't matter. And we will be so distant from our government, fewer people will vote. Let me tell you the other crime that's being committed here in my view. Most of the big money in politics, which doesn't come from us, comes from people with very special interests. And so we have false debates. We have candidates on the far left and candidates on the far right accepting money with a specific purpose. Try to run for public office and say, I'm going to compromise. I'm going to try to act in the public interest. I'm going to be bipartisan where possible. Try to raise money with that bumper sticker. You can't do it in American political life. This organization and this pledge is fundamentally important fundamentally important. So I applaud all of you. I applaud Dan Weeks, and we need to get about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. And it goes without saying that this movement obviously would not exist without a team that has been building it, and without hundreds, indeed thousands of activists who have been walking in the footsteps of Granny D. And I, and I thank all of you for carrying this movement forward, and my team for making this happen. Our next speaker is someone who has served in our community in countless ways over many years. On the Republican side of the aisle, Brad Cook is a shareholder and past president of the Sheehan Finney Bass and Green Law Firm here in Manchester. He served on countless commissions and boards including as chair currently of the New Hampshire Ballot Law Commission and as past chair of the Citizen Funded Elections Task Force that recommended a sweeping overhaul of New Hampshire's campaign finance laws that has yet to pass but that will pass in time. Brad is chair of the Rudman Center's campaign and the recipient of countless awards including Manchester Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year and most recently the Business and Industry Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. Please join me in welcoming Brad Cook. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. One of the beauties of following Paul Revere is you don't feel as old. <laughs> because he's pretty old. Um, and one of the beauties of following Dan Weeks and John Broderick is they've said everything you were going to say. So I thought I'd say a couple of things that uh, they didn't say which are how quickly politics has changed. One of the things we don't think about when we talk about money in politics 
is what good people aren't running because of the money in politics. What good people don't want to spend 50 to 70 percent of their day calling people up and begging for money. What people don't want to have to raise a hundred million dollars to run for this, that, or the next thing, and what people just feel unclean doing it. And you don't know the answer to that question, although I've got some evidence because I've had some people uh, that I've asked to run from office and they said, I can't do that stuff and I won't do that stuff. In 1980, which to some of you seems like a long time ago and to some of us seems like yesterday, we ran a campaign for a law partner of mine named Warren Rudman who wanted to run for the Senate and in February he came down the hall and said to a bunch of people, let's start a campaign for the Senate. And we started by driving to Plymouth, New Hampshire and had four people in a room. And the next year he was elected to the United States Senate, having pledged to take no PAC money Bravo. and having pledged to do it for three or 400,000 bucks. And we did it. We mimeographed materials. We walked the streets. We did it citizen by citizen. We didn't have printouts that said, don't go to that house, they might be a Democrat. We didn't have a printout that said, the poll says so-and-so is doing such and such. We just did it by saying to people, this is a good candidate, you ought to vote for him. That's not the way it is today. I read the paper last Sunday about the analysis of the presidential candidates and who had a chance and who didn't have a chance. And some of the finest, most experienced people in the race were given no chance, why? Not because they didn't have ideas, not because they didn't have experience, not because of all the things we should be thinking about. It was because they hadn't raised as much money or they didn't have as big a personal bank account. That's just wrong. We know there's gonna be money in politics. It takes money for politics. The problem is, as John said, where's the money coming from? What's the expectation? And unless it's transparent on what's going on, and unless there are limitations put on it, we're all in trouble. As you go to these campaign headquarters today, I'm gonna to go up to Concord and watch one of the candidates register for president just because I'm a junkie. But, uh, <laughs> but as you go to the campaign headquarters, ask them that question. I disagree that it's not the most important issue. It's the frame on the picture. It's the thing that surrounds the whole process. It is the question. And so what do they think? What do they think about it? They hate it, unless you're Trump, he's spending his own money, but they hate it. <laughs> he's probably hate spending his own money, but, but they're doing it and they're not changing it. And what will they tell you they will do about it? And ask them specifically, Will they support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United? It's a very simple question. And if you get anything other than a one word answer, they're obfuscating with you. So ask that question. You're doing a great job. Um, rebellion should be kept under control, but um, good luck and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Brad Cook. And a final speaker before we get ready to enjoy a little ice cream and, and hit the road here to the presidential candidate offices. Um, we are proud to ally with all sorts of groups, liberal, conservative, and in between. And one group that has come alongside to work with us on this cause is the newly formed New Hampshire Independent Voters Alliance. And would you please join me in welcoming the head of that group, Tiani Coleman. Bravo! Thank you, Dan. It's good to be here. Uh, we are independent voters because we want to be independent of the special interests, which include the monopolization of the electoral process, but definitely includes being independent of all of the big money that is in politics that actually takes away the independence of our candidates, and takes away the ability for the average voter to have a voice. And that's what we're fighting for, is for we the people. And so we are proud to support this pledge and to stand in coalition with Open Democracy and the New Hampshire Rebellion and to be able to fight together because that's what it's gonna take 
for we the people to be able to actually make a difference here in this country, we have to be able to form coalitions with each other and work together. All of these different people who support these things, we need to work together to be able to change what's going on here. So we're happy to be here. We support the pledge and we'll be continuing to work on these issues, on getting money out of politics and on electoral reform that gives an independent voice to candidates and to voters. Thank you. The people united cannot be defeated. Thank you, thank you. I think it may be that time to, to start getting our voices ready to, to take to the streets peacefully and to deliver our pledges to the presidential candidates. Just before we do that, we are serious about this pledge. And we have this banner to my right, which we will take with us throughout the state as over the next three months, we go to towns and cities across New Hampshire, calling on our fellow citizens, 10,000 or more, to sign the pledge. And so to begin to add their names to this banner, I want to call up the former Chief Justice and Brad Cook. And then once they have signed, I want to invite all of us to, to add our names in marker right here on the banner. And as you do that, I want to also invite you, once you put your name down there and, and signed one of the sign-in sheets here, I want to invite you to enjoy a little Ben and & Jerry's and get ready to hit the road. Now, just before we add our names, this is, as I said, the beginning of this final critical push to the New Hampshire primary. And I want you to imagine for a moment, three months from now, just down the road here, in Manchester, it will be, we can expect, really cold then in January and early February. We will be culminating this New Hampshire rebellion for this presidential primary February 5th to 7th as we erect a large tent here in Manchester, the rebellion headquarters, and over that final critical weekend before the presidential primary, we will be calling citizens from around the state and around the country to join us, we promise there will be heat in the tent, but we will gather that weekend and demand the presidential candidates come to us to join us and, and participate in 11th hour actions as we take to the streets for a final time here in Manchester and neighboring towns. So get ready for three months from now here in Manchester in Veterans Park. It'll be warm but cold outside and our spirits will be high. And in the meantime, we do need your help signing this pledge today and taking this out with you to your towns to get this on your town warrants so that come spring we can pass we can endorse this agenda all over the state and if you can stick around for that once we finished our march we'll be doing a short training and, and having lunch just up hanover street at the office but for now thank you for coming out i want to invite chief justice broderick and brad cook to add their names to this banner and all of us to follow suit grab some ice cream and let's gather again in just a few minutes to head to the streets to deliver these petitions to the presidential candidates so thank you once again Get some ice cream. I need to get ready to walk.